Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight we bring you three in-depth interviews recorded in the past 24 hours. Later we'll sit down with the Director of Public Health, Dr Sohail Bharti, to discuss vaccinations, face masks and how he thinks the easing of COVID-19 restrictions is going. Before then, we'll speak to the Minister for Economic Development, Sir Joe Bosano, about the government's joint venture with a Chinese company to build a new residential home from modules that will be prefabricated in China and shipped over. First, though, the far-right party Vox has failed to convince the Spanish Parliament to reject the tax treaty over Gibraltar. The Spanish Minister for Foreign Affairs today defended the tax treaty, saying it's an international bilateral agreement between the UK and Spain in relation to Gibraltar aimed at resolving conflicts of fiscal residence. Speaking in the Spanish Parliament, Arancha González Laya denied Vox's accusations that the agreement implies recognition of Gibraltar. Indeed, she said, far from it, as it hasn't been signed by any Gibraltar local authority. Well, my colleague Christine Vasquez sought the reaction of the Chief Minister, Fabian Picardo. Well, I'm not surprised that the Spanish minister should say that the first treaty that they've entered into in relation to Gibraltar uh, since Utrecht has been designed by them to preserve uh, Spanish interests. First of all, uh, it's what you would expect somebody defending a treaty in their parliament to say. Uh, second, it is transparently the case that that's what they sought to do. And also that successive governments of Gibraltar have insisted that we were happy to provide full transparency and information to Spain about anybody who is a resident of Spain who is doing business in Gibraltar because we are not doing any business that requires a lack of transparency in order to prosper. So I'm very happy actually that the way that this tax treaty has come out in the end, it enables us to become, as uh, Alfonso Gomez Lachelli said, he is the spokesman for the PSOE in the Spanish Cortes, an ally of Spain and the rest of the international community in the fight against money laundering. So a complete turn of what the Spanish position has traditionally been. Uh, that is what we have achieved. And we've achieved it, I think, at just the right time uh, historically as well. One of the benef benefits, if I understand you correctly, is that Spain will no longer consider us a tax haven. Uh, we know we're not. So doesn't this really amount to blackmail? They sort of do the same at the frontier. They, they instigate clues and then they ask for something and we try to remove them. Look, um, if, if you want any opinion from me about the way that Spain has behaved in the last 30 years uh, with Gibraltar, the only thing you're going to get is an even harsher statement than the one that you posed in the question. You know, I think Spain has behaved badly in relation to Gibraltar in the time that we've both been members of the European Union. She's sought to abuse all of the rules to load the deck in order to try and achieve an advantage in the way that she deals with the Gibraltarians. The Gibraltarians, with a government led by me, with governments led by former chief ministers have been straight in their dealings with Spain. That's what we always set out to do, to try and demonstrate not just to the world but also to our neighbour that the people of Gibraltar play by the rules, and not just the rules that, uh, that are convenient to us by, but by all the rules. Um, and that is the approach that we're always going to take. So I'm very pleased that we are now able to show the world that Spain has subscribed a treaty with Gibraltar which no longer enabled Spain to pretend, again pretend because we never were, that Gibraltar is in some way a tax haven or not complying with international rules. Remember that in the code group of the European Union, when there were 28 member states of the European Union, the United Kingdom being one of them, 20 uh, seven member states of the EU said that Gibraltar played by the rules and was in, acting in keeping with international rules on taxation and one did not and that was Spain. Um, she was not playing by the rules by taking that country position. We will continue to play by the rules and this is now our ability to demonstrate it to the rest of the world. I'd like to pick you up on something that you said. You said with the treaty with Gibraltar, that's one of the things that she does say to Vox is that on sovereignty, as, as far as Spain is concerned, there are no concessions or recognition of Gibraltar's competent authorities. Far from it, she says. The treaty was signed by Britain and Spain and it's they who will designate the bodies and authorities for the treaty under a joint coordination committee. Indeed, if, if you read the treaty, which she then went on to do when she made that statement, it says this treaty is signed by the United Kingdom 
as the state that can enter into international agreements, as a state responsible for Gibraltar. That's the reality. Look, Gibraltar has a constitution. We have a constitution given to us by the United Kingdom. That constitution sets out that we have no competence in external relations uh, and the uh, party that is able under international law to acquire international relations for Gibraltar is presently the United Kingdom. Do I like that? No, I don't. Is it the legal reality today? Yes, it is. What's the solution to that? Further constitutional reform so that Gibraltar can take the right to enter into international relations for Gibraltar. So I hope that uh, those in other parties who might criticize the government of Gibraltar for agreeing in a concordat with the United Kingdom that the United Kingdom should enter into these arrangements. Remember, the United Kingdom only signed this treaty because Gibraltar approved that it should, and the concordat sets out the terms of that. All those who criticize that now in Gibraltar will recognize that they were wrong when they said that the current constitution that we have is the maximum possible level of cell government short of independence and will join with the government in taking the further necessary steps for constitutional development so that that cannot continue to happen. But look, we cannot operate in a vacuum. We have to operate within the legal reality of what our constitution is and what the international legal position is. And we mustn't put our heads in the sand and pretend to be something we are not. We are not a sovereign state with the ability to enter into international treaties. The Foreign Minister talks of the treaty in the context of Brexit, reminding us Spain's agreement will be necessary for the future relationship between Gibraltar and the EU. So we may have had little choice, but does it lock us into compliance with EU rules even after we've left? There are parts of the treaty where Gibraltar has taken the obligation to comply with new rules in the future as they develop, because they're the same rules that we will comply with under our existing obligations in the OECD. Remember that Gibraltar is talking about staying in tune with best practice in international tax affairs, not in dynamic alignment on issues which may become European directives in the future, but issues which are international tax practice. But we have to be very clear about what it is that the minister uh, is doing. She is setting out Spain's position. Spain's position in the negotiations of the future relationship. The position of the United Kingdom and Gibraltar is different, so nobody in Gibraltar should believe that what a Spanish minister says about their position on Gibraltar somehow binds Gibraltar. We mustn't brainwash ourselves into believing what a Spanish minister says. I actually much prefer the things that have been said uh, by Alfonso Gomez de Chávez, the uh, PSOE spokesman who spoke in that debate as well, who presented things in a slightly different way, who talked about extending a hand of friendship to Gibraltar and working together with Gibraltar on key issues, and who defended the position of the agreement between Gibraltar uh, and Spain on these issues against the position of Vox, um, which was supported by the Partido Popular, who uh, actually, in their statements, enumerated all of the gains that Gibraltar has made in the context of this discussion. So it's one thing to read and to question me on what the minister has said, and of course that is the position of the government of Spain, you're right to do that, but it's also very interesting to read what it is that Vox and Partido Popular say that uh, Gibraltar has gained in this context. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, if in our parliament you end up with uh, one side that might be against the treaty going through all the lists of things that the Spanish government has said, be interesting to see a Spanish, uh, uh, a Spanish government having support in the Gibraltar Parliament uh, for what they say is the position in respect of the Spanish tax treaty and the Gibraltar government actually <laughs> looking at the things that Vox and Partido Popular have said and saying look at the things that we say we have achieved which Vox and Partido Popular also say are our achievements in this uh, even Vox, uh, fascinating though, debate no doubt to come. E even Vox says the treaty favours Spain of course I don't think Vox is now going to be accepted as a voice of reason. Not at all uh, and, uh, and if that is what Vox says. Uh, do we believe the things that Vox say? I don't think uh, we do. Um, but uh, one thing is clear. Uh, one thing that Gibraltar has wanted to do, and I want to be uh, you know, very explicit about this. I've been saying it from the beginning, but I want to be explicit about it with your viewers. Gibraltar has consistently said, under successive governments and chief ministers, there is no dirty money here from Spain. We don't do money laundering. We don't hide Spanish money here. You're wrong to say that we are pirates doing this business. So now, when we enter into an agreement that gives Spain that level of transparency, which we have all successively been offering Spain, I don't think we have anything to fear. And I wonder whether there are people who are trying to say that this is not a good agreement, who might actually 
have had something to hide or fear. I don't believe there are such people in Gibraltar. I believe Gibraltar has done fair, open and transparent business uh, with uh, people from around the world in a proper way, in keeping with international rules on tax compliance as they are in the 21st century. So if there's nothing to hide, there's nothing to fear from transparency. Chief Minister, clarify something for me. Does this treaty um, affect, uh, put an end to double residency, where people have for years been paying their taxes, both in Gibraltar and in Spain? Will th would they be, still be entitled to the services they're paying for? No, so you've got to understand what it is that, uh, that we talk about when we talk about double taxation. Under the European Union acquis... Double residency. There's no such thing as far as I understand it. What we're talking about is double taxation, right? So if you work in Gibraltar and you are resident in Spain, you pay tax in Gibraltar because you are taxed in the place where you receive your income. Um, and then in your, your place of residence, which in most instances and for the purposes of this uh, treaty is Spain, you pay the difference if the tax code which applies to you is higher. So if you pay 20% tax in Gibraltar on your income, but you live in Spain, and the tax rate which applies to you in Spain, for example, is 40%, then you would pay an additional 20% in Spain. The total amount you would have paid would be no more than in the place where you pay the highest level of tax, either the place of work or the place of residence. Would you, would you forfeit but rights let, let in me Gibraltar? Finish, let me finish uh, explaining this because it's complex. When the European Union Treaty no longer applies, you might not have had the benefit of double taxation. So double taxation sounds bad, but actually it's advantageous because a double taxation agreement ensures that you never pay the tax twice. You only pay the higher level, right? So, for example, um, you are not paying the 20% the here and the 40% there because that will be a total of 60%. You're paying you, the difference. You're entitled to pay only the difference. When we leave the European Union, potentially, you might have been made to pay twice. In other words, the 20% here and the 40% in Spain. Although Spain previously had observed that as a matter of uh, tax uh, uh, elegance, if you want to call it that, but no obligation to do that. So there was a risk that the Spanish government might have required you to pay the whole 40%. You're going to continue now as a matter of international treaty post ratification to have the right to rely on the right of double taxation. So you'll never pay both the tax rates. You'll only pay a maximum of the higher of the composite. The Chief Minister, Fabian Picardo, speaking to my colleague, Christine Vasquez. Well, in Gibraltar's parliament earlier this week, the government confirmed it will form a joint venture with a Chinese company to build a new residential home for senior citizens using modules that will be built in China and shipped over. Sir Joe Bosano said the home will be built on a 1,000 square metre plot off Bishop Garawana Road, close to Bishop Ganija House, and will see investment from a Gibraltarian entrepreneur. The joint venture is with Beijing Lihuan Construction Group, a company involved in building Beijing Airport as well as airports in Manchester. The Minister for Economic Development referred to a report by consultants McKenzie & Company, which predicts the industry is expected to grow significantly in the coming years. Sir Joe hopes Gibraltar will be used as a base to introduce the product to nearby markets. Modular building is still uncommon, but it is on the rise, with one company erecting a 57-storey tower in just 19 days. Sir Joe told me he hopes the residential home in Gibraltar could be ready for 180 people to move into within 12 months. While the building will be privately owned, the government will ask for priority in order to address its waiting list for senior citizens' accommodation. I sat down with Sir Joe and he told me the residential home will be built to UK standards. It will have a roof garden and ground floor parking. It will essentially offer assisted living with a GP's surgery, kitchens on each floor and a laundry facility. Well, it, I, I can understand it. It would be strange here because it's not something that, that we've done. But I mean, it's been around for some time. But now it, there is a new emphasis on it. In fact, the United Kingdom government has um, officially announced uh, an investment of 62 billion in developing this sector on the basis that they are not able to meet the demand for housing and the demand for building in the UK using traditional methods which are much more labor intensive and subject to all sorts of, of delays, you know, because, because when you're building on a building site in the open air, then uh, the inclement weather may stop that, the entire thing, whereas this is all done inside a factory, 
at the roof and therefore it's a continuous process. In effect, what is happening in the industry now is what happened with the car when, when Ford con uh, uh, developed the concept of having a factory line with a car starting off with the chassis on one end and coming out at the other end of the line fully finished. That is what they're doing with houses now. So you're talking about massive factories in uh, on mainland China and then uh, those prefabricated modules are are shipped over on a large container vessel and brought to Gibraltar and then assembled here. Yeah, so here you see that there will be work for the local industry in part of uh, the work that needs to be here, which is the, the foundations and the structure into which the units will be slotted and that we will source locally. Um, but the, 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 the speed means, for example, the commitments in the, in, in the manifesto on the National Economic Plan can only be delivered in the time scale of four years with a date, uh, a, a, a date uh, determined by the next election in that time scale by using modular building. It cannot be done any other way. This is why specifically I mentioned that this is how it was going to be done. There's also a cost saving. It's also like anything else that is done in a factory. There's a greater precision in terms of greater quality control in a factory environment individually look we've had for example in in the uh, in the um, midtown development that has been with the offices there there have been things that subcontractors did wrong which had to be put right and that is because the quality control on a side with with a lot of subcontractors is not the same as people who are working permanently in a factory doing this and nothing else and only doing a bit of the job. Just like somebody puts a car door on the car when it comes to that stage, somebody will put a, a door of the house when the house arrives at that stage of the conveyor belt, as it were. Are you saying that this technique is going to be applied to some of the other buildings, such as uh, the government no, affordable no, homes? I'm not saying that. I'm, I, there are affordable homes in the program of the National Economic Plan. So, you know, this is not substituting the government's commitment in, in the other parts of the manifesto. This is the bit that comes under me, which was never going to be done by the government. It, the government was going to be the promoter and the coordinator of this. But remember, during the election campaign that uh, Roy Clinton asked me, well, what this, well, where is the money going to come from and how, how much of an impact is it going to have? And I said, this is, the whole thing is expected to, to generate about 500 million, right? So this will be something that will be financed in the process of construction, but I've already got investors. And by the way, they are not Chinese. And there isn't a Chinese that has bought mortgages in housing estate. So the people who are saying that in the in the social media either don't know what they're talking about or are deliberately trying to mislead people. Not that it would be wrong if somebody with legitimate funds wanted to invest in this because it's a good investment. But one of the things is that because it will cost less, we've got a situation where we've got a very long waiting list for people who want to go into a residential home because they have difficulty in elderly people who have got difficulty in coping in their own. It is not possible for the government to finance and run more homes on the basis of our existing costs. We don't know what is going to be possible for us in the light of the coronavirus. You need to understand that we will have great difficulty depending on just how big the impact that there is. But at the moment what we're doing is facing a situation where, as the Chief Minister said uh, in, a, in an interview with GBC when he was asked, are you saying that the government's revenue is, is uh, dropping by tens of millions? He said it could even be hundreds of millions. Well, hundreds of millions, you know, is what we spend every two months, right? So we're talking about a situation that when we come out of this, we will need to reassess what we can be do, doing in the terms of the government's commitments that are there and what we can afford to do. This is something I know we can afford to do because we're not doing it. We're making it happen. We're bringing it about, but it is on the basis that everything that we're going to be doing in the National Economic Plan element is as a result of inward investment. So the Chinese are not involved in the inward investment part. They're involved in the supply line. Mm -hmm. and. 
it's important to do it with a Chinese partner at this end because frankly in China you can in fact buy products that are not what they claim to be the one way you can guarantee that what you're getting is a real McCoy is if you've got a partner who ensures the quality of the product in China and a partner that is a substantial uh, element of the Chinese economic environment so that nobody's going to sell, they may sell to John Bosan or something that doesn't work, but they're not going to sell it to the Beijing construction company whose owner is the Beijing municipality. Because, because uh, it's a 50-50 joint venture. Of course. So they really are predominantly involved in sourcing the supplies and in making sure we're getting what we need. And they have got the experience. I mean, they've been doing this in the United Kingdom and they've been doing it in the United States. And anybody can go into the webpage of Newcastle University and see a student village built using this methodology for 1,200 students for Newcastle University. And this was done, uh, you know, by the company that we are talking to in terms of sourcing the materials. Are you concerned at all about being um a, a relatively, if, if you excuse me saying so, a small fish compared to the partner that you're partnering with? Well, I am not buying from my partner. My partner is buying from other people in order to supply something in, on the basis that they hope that we will be able to open bigger markets for them. You know, we are now talking uh, of the possibility eventually of using Gibraltar as a hub to go maybe uh, south into Africa and north into Europe and to have, if you like, the product here that people don't have to go to China to see what it is, they can actually come over here if we are selling to customers in, in this geographical area, we can say, well, you can come in Gibraltar, you can see what has been done here and then you can see what the finished product looks like. In respect of the partner with, within the joint venture, obviously China is extremely economically successful and has enjoyed a period of unprecedented growth. But what about its politics? You know, we see what's happening in Hong Kong. You've fought for much of your political life for Gibraltar's self-determination. I don't believe that China recognizes Gibraltar's self-determination, does it? Well, I can tell you that the Chinese representative in the seminars of the uh, United Nations in all the years that I've been there has never once spoken in favor of Spain. They haven't spoken in favor of Gibraltar, but they have never spoken in favor of Spain. So for me, as long as they don't support Spain, that is enough, you know? Because look, when the Falklands uh, was invaded by the Argentinians, the United States was neutral. And when our referendum was put to the vote in 1967-68 in the United Nations, the United States abstained. Our best friend from the UK, the, the Commonwealth voted with the UK, the United States abstained. So, I mean, there are in, 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 in global politics, sometimes a small place does well if it can stop a big place from being successful in lobbying somebody. And therefore, for us, to get people to vote in our favor and against Spain's ambitions is a difficult thing. But if we get people not to vote with Spain, that really is a sufficiently successful result. And I have to say that as far as self-determination in Hong Kong is concerned, it was a British colony, and the United Kingdom government chose not to have a referendum in Hong Kong before deciding to do a deal with China and hand them over. So that was something that, you know, in my view, should have happened, that the people of Hong Kong should have had a say, mm -hmm. but they never did. So, but that doesn't make you nervous? The politics doesn't well, make you nervous? Look, I, I, the reality of it is that, that China is a big investor in the United Kingdom, you know. This company has got a big presence in the United Kingdom. The, lots of things that are in the United Kingdom, people think of as being British, including the famous black cab, now belongs to the Chinese. So what you have to re accept that is that, that 
independent of the rhetoric, which sometimes is for internal consumption, the behavior of the Western world is not one that they don't deal with dictators. They deal with dictators on the left and with dictators on the right. You know, they still buy Saudi uh, uh, oil in spite of what happened with the, the, that journalist who was working for an American uh, newspaper who was dismembered in in, a, in the Turkish embassy. So that is what the big boys do. And that's certainly for us to say we can run an economy where we decide who we trade with or who we buy from on the on the basis of whether we approve of their political decision making internally. Uh, look, I don't think we could survive five minutes with such a, a philosophy. I don't know of any government in the history of Gibraltar has ever done it. I mean, we never stopped buying chorizos when Franco was there. You've, you've made some very passionate environmental speeches in, in recent uh, times. What can you say of the carbon footprint for this project, given that China runs on a lot of coal-powered power stations and also that you're going to have to ship uh, something, you're not sourcing something locally, you're shipping something halfway across the world? Well, look, I mean, I can tell you this method of construction has got a lower carbon footprint than the normal concrete structures. So if we did a concrete structure here, as we have done in the other houses and in the schools, we would be putting it more here in the atmosphere than would have been put in China if it had been prefabricated in China. It's the same atmosphere. And finally, Sir Joe, what can you tell us about the actual first project that you expect to uh, construct the um, the senior citizens' uh, residential home? Yeah. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's 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 on uh, Bishop Caruana uh, Road, n opposite uh, Bishop Canilla Apartments, yeah. right? Uh, it's a corner where the Rook side used to be, a thousand square meters. Uh, it will house one hundred and 80 uh, pensioners, uh, but less than 180 rooms, because I think we've got about plan 10, something like 10 for, for married couples. Uh, all of that is being done with the UK standards for homes. Uh, it will have, a, you know, the, the thing has now got to planning. Uh, it will have a roof garden. There will be a, on the ground floor parking, then there will be um, a surgery so that doctors can go to the surgery there to see patients. Uh, there will be a, a kitchen there and there will be uh, kitchens on each floor. There will be a laundry there so it's a self-contained thing and uh, because we are able to deliver it at a lower cost it means that the investor who is a Gibraltarian by the way not Chinese will be able to make money. I mean, this is a private investment, but an investment which will deliver a home that we can access at a cost which does not reflect the profit, because the savings in the cost of the building means that the cost will not finish up in us having to pay more for the residents, because that is where the profit margin for the investor will come. So do you expect to be able to uh, populate it? Um, would that be for the government to do, even though it's a privately owned building? Well, the, the, we, are, we are asking the investor to give us priority. And, and clearly, uh, since we've got a waiting list of about 500, you know, it will be a very welcome thing. Of course, it will have the additional effect that uh, a lot of those uh, 180 uh, will release homes that will go to people on the waiting list, so it will have that secondary effect, which is good as well. And I think uh, if it works, and if we can deliver it on the time scale that I want, um, I, I'm not guaranteeing that we will be with that date, but my ambition is to, op to open the place on the 1st of May next year. That quickly? Yes. Within a year? Yep, so that people can start moving in on the 2nd of May. And you wouldn't tell us if you weren't confident it was going to happen? Well, I don't want... Uh, look, uh, uh, this is new, right? I've done things quickly before. You know, when, when we started reclaiming the, the land, nobody could believe it, that the island would grow and grow and grow on a daily basis. This is the target that I've given them. And I think we can make it. Well, we look forward to talking to you more about this in the coming weeks and months, Sergio. Thanks for your time. Thank you.